All right, uh, welcome back for the second session. Hope you all are feeling awake and alive. <laughs> cool. Um, um, so I hope that, uh, that this, a short lesson on Encounter uh, was helpful. And I mean, I'll share the PDF uh, with you as well. I've shared the PDF with those online. Um, so do you all have like a class WhatsApp group or something? OK, then I'll probably share it with one of you, and you can put it on that uh, WhatsApp group. I'll share the PDF of the Encounter notes, and uh, you can, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, it's a very favorite subject of mine, uh, Encounter. It's uh, There's so much more to learn about it. But then now, today, we will move on. Uh, page 20 in your notes. Page 20 in your notes. Um, we resume from worship defies definition. Is there, no? Is there? It's a different page number or something? 18. <clears throat> oh, is it? Okay. Hmm. I, need, I need to check that then. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, worship defies definition. Uh, and we start talking about, uh, we go to John chapter 4 now. John chapter 4. Um, the verse mentioned there is 23 and 24. But I mentioned, right, uh, out of all the four Gospels, John is the only Gospel that talks about worship. Um, like directly using the word worship. Okay, <laughs> okay uh, John chapter 4, I want to read from verse 21. Okay, John chapter 4, verse 21 onwards. It says, um, Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you, you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. Okay, underline that if you have to. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Verse 23, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. If it isn't already underlined in your Bible, you can underline that. <laughs> For they are the king of worshippers. They're the kind of worshippers, sorry, uh, the Father seeks. <laughs> God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. Okay, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth okay um so uh, we can talk about this again it's been spoken about so much in uh, a in the topic of worship worldwide uh, google worship and one of the teachings is definitely be on john chapter 4 uh and whatnot right uh but it's very interesting uh father is seeking Yeah. Father is seeking? Pastors. Evangelists. Missionaries. All of them are important, by the way. Right? You know, thank God for pastors. Thank God for evangelists. Thank God for missionaries. Right? Thank God for apostles and whatnot. But then, Father is seeking not just worshippers, not just He's not even saying a father is seeking worship. It's very important. <laughs> He's not saying father is seeking worshippers, or he's not saying father is seeking worship, uh, just worship. He's seeking true worshippers. Now, we'll talk about this in the next class if we have the time. If there is true worshippers, that means there are false worshippers. Yeah? If there are true worshippers, that means there are false worshippers. So we'll park that idea in the basement. They are in the basement, so we'll park it there. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about it a little later uh, in the next chapter. All right. So um, one of the first things, uh, the reason I want to read from 21 and 22 at least is, Jesus says, um, you Samaritans 
do not know i mean you samaritans worship what you do not know everybody say do not know okay that means there is no knowledge no knowledge right knowledge uh, the word knowledge comes from the word no isn't it so no knowledge that means they don't have an understanding there is no in other words there is no revelation are you with me you samaritans worship something that you don't have a revelation of but we worship what we do know right so that means jesus is saying we are worshiping with an understanding we worship because we have a revelation revelation comes with an encounter remember okay don't forget encounter okay now we finally come to verse 23 and saying but the hour is coming and, and now when the worst true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father is seeking such to worship him god is spirit for those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth so very quickly um what does it mean to worship him in spirit everybody say in spirit okay it's the holy spirit okay it's not the other kind of spirit <laughs> Okay, uh, the Holy Spirit. So the first thing is there. In spirit simply means we worship Him by the power of the Holy Spirit that abides in us. Right? We worship Him by the power of the Holy Spirit that abides in us. In your notes, uh, just look at it. It says, the true worshipper worships from his heart, from his innermost being, from the core of his being, with everything with him, not half-heartedly lacking in zeal right true worshipers worship from their hearts from their innermost being a uh, true worship is our spirit corresponding with god's spirit okay true worship is our spirit corresponding with god's spirit corresponding simply means communication that's what correspondence is right our spirit is communicating with his spirit um and speaking of the gift of tongues is a beautiful lang a beautiful way in how we communicate now um okay when you can't hear me or when i can't hear you uh what do i do when, when, when i ask is like hey sean i can't hear you what do i do i i change my posture i, I try doing this right it's like what's that yes or no right and like sean i can't hear you can you be a little louder most of the times that is also what we do when we can't hear god or when we want to hear god okay we try to hear him in the physical it's like god what are you saying i can't i can't, I can't hear you do we do that or is it just me who's done that it's like, mm, oh, what are you saying you know i'm trying too hard to listen to him to hear him in my physical natural ear are you with me? But so many times, when I'm not even trying hard, this happens. I don't know why this happens only to me, but most of the times, <laughs> it's like when I'm vacuuming the house, no? You know, when I'm just vacuuming, you know, like such a mundane thing. You know, vacuuming, and suddenly he's like, he speaks to my heart as like, Oh, where does that where did that come from? When I'm so relaxed in my spirit, when I'm so relaxed like, physically and whatnot, he looks for the point of rest and say, okay. And he speaks. Has anybody else had that moment? Like while cooking, it's like that must be God. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It happens all the time, is because he is spirit. He speaks to our spirit, right? Uh, I want to just very briefly talk about this uh, one thing, and we'll talk about this in chapter 8 maybe. But the first thing what happened in the Garden of Eden at the fall, when Adam sinned and Adam and Eve sinned, when God comes and asks, Adam, where art thou? Where are you? Once again, God is asking a question. doesn't mean he didn't know where they were. It's like, their spirit was disconnected from the spirit of god that's what sin is 
That's what sin is. It's, it separates your spirit from the spirit of God. The minute, John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The minute, that moment when you say, I believe in the Lord Jesus, I receive him as my personal Lord and Savior, your spirit and his spirit is reunited. You are, that's what we call it as, born again right and now there's a clear highway for him to communicate to you and for you to communicate with him right and so that is the point of what we are talking about here is that we worship him by the holy spirit that abides in us right and then we say okay there's holy spirit you teach me how to worship you Isn't it? I mean, that's the easiest way, you know, uh, the easiest praise and worship course you can ever do it is you teach me how to worship you and he'll teach you and you can just worship. So that's the thing, right? You worship him in the spirit that we worship by the power of the Holy Spirit that abides in us. Re re see that word there. It says by the power. Everybody say power. Okay, how many of you know that Holy Spirit is power? You know that, right? He is power. And I can't even begin to describe or define that. Um, does anybody here drive a car? Oh, yeah, awesome. Yeah, no. Uh, so we all understand the difference between a manual steering and an uh, automatic steering. Uh, sorry, a power steering. <laughs> we do, right? <laughs> Have you seen uh, the manual truck drivers of those days, you know, uh, where they'll start turning from this side? It's like, you know, it's, it's very hard to turn a truck with, with its manual. And then nowadays you see uh, Volvo bus drivers you know, it's like, hey, like on dosa, you know, it's like this you know, power steering, isn't it? When we try to worship with our own strength, you'll be exhausted. So like you are trying to do everything. You are trying to make things happen. And then Holy Spirit comes into the scene. He's like, hey, chill. They say, just relax. Hey. And then he makes it look so easy. You know, just left turn okay 360 whatever you want to do right he is raw power another instance in the scriptures we see that um, you know when gabriel is talking with mary the mother of jesus right uh, so gabriel comes and says you're going to be pregnant you're going to carry the lord and she says okay how is this going to be you know how, how is this possible i have never been with a man before what does gabriel say the Spirit of God will come over you. Yeah? Think about this, guys. The Spirit of God will come over you. We are talking about an eternal God. Right? He has been there from everlasting to everlasting. We don't... Our minds can't comprehend that, right? I, I keep saying this so many times. And so for the Holy Spirit to, you know, to come over her, Mary, and make this eternal God like into it, like a seed and place it in her womb. Can you imagine the power of that? Right? And so worshiping him in spirit is not a suggestion. It's not one of the suggestions. It's like, you know, it, I think it would be nice, sister, if you can worship him in the spirit. It's a nice suggestion. It's not a nice idea. It's like, what an idea, Sarji. Let's worship him. It's a command. It's you. It's not like you have another option. You worship him in the spirit, or uh, you know, you have to worship him in the spirit. And that's made possible because you are born again. Are you with me? Right. So that is worshiping him in the spirit. And then the next thing it goes on to say is, worship him in truth. Everybody say truth. Okay, what is truth is 
We worship him according to the revealed word of God. So this is truth. Right? We worship him according to the revealed. Say revealed. Revealed. Revelation. Right? So in truth, the true worshiper worships in sincerity without any pretense or hypocrisy. The true worshippers true worshiper worships as prescribed in God's word. For God's word is truth. God's word is right. Um, John chapter 17, verse 17, it says, right, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Okay, it, the John chapter 17, verse 17 is there in the notes. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Right? Remember, uh, you know, Jesus starts off the conversation by saying, "You Samaritans uh, worship that you something that you do not know, no knowledge. There is no revelation, isn't it?" Um, let's very one verse. Can someone read Psalm 119, verse 18? I hope you finish underlining the whole psalm, all those words that are Psalm 119, verse 18, very quickly. Mm. Open my eyes. Okay. Okay. Let's all of us read the verse together. Okay. English version. Psalm 119, verse 18. Are you, is everybody there? Okay. Five more seconds. Psalm 119, verse 18. We'll read together. Uh, join us, guys, online. Okay. Ready? Read. Thanks. So, open my eyes. There is a revelation, right? That I may see the wondrous, the different translations use different words, like the beautiful things of your word or law, right? Everything points to God's word, right? And so, I mean, there are times when you read the Bible, you just keep reading and reading and reading, and then there are times like, oh, so that's what it is. As you get what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like, um, so that's a revelation right there. So we worship him uh, according to his uh, word, right? In the revealed word of God. So, uh, so that's worshiping him in truth. Uh, okay, let me just go fast forward now uh, to the next page. Hey, are you guys with me so far, guys? Okay, uh, the next page, uh, we begin to talk about uh, what happens when we worship God. So we spoke about uh, what is worship, uh, recognizing Him, reverence for God, communion with God. Worship is our response to an encounter with God, worshiping Him in spirit and in truth, what it, what it stands for. And now we look at what happens when we worship. Okay, what happens when we worship? <laughs> worship does not add anything to God or change God. Okay, that's the first thing we need to understand that. Okay. It changes us. We are changed when we worship. Okay, so the first thing is worship transforms us. Let's go to Psalm 115. Psalm 115. Psalm 115, verse 4 to 8. Psalm 115, verse 4 to 8. Okay, it says like this. But their idols are silver and gold, made by the hands of men. They have mouths, but cannot speak. Eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear. Noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but cannot feel. Feet, but they cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Verse 8. Those who make them will be like them. And who will all and so will all who trust in them. Okay, remember those lines, right? Those who make them 
will be like them. Okay, what's the first point? The worship transforms or changes us, right? You become like the one you worship. Okay, you must have heard that before. You become like the one you worship. Now, in the first classes, we've learned that worship is simply what affection, your devotion, anything that you give your time to, right? And so, you know, you just think about one thing day and night, night and day, whatnot. You are worshipping that object, you are worshipping that person and whatnot, right? In verse 8, it says you become like the idols that they worship. They have everything, all the features and whatnot, but they can't do anything. Let's look at Exodus chapter 34, verse 27 to 30. To 30. Exodus chapter 34. Can someone read that, please, for the class? Exodus 34, 27 to 30. Right. Thank you. So another aspect of worship is just you spending time with God, isn't it? It's something that we learned. Yeah? It's just you spending time with Him, you're being with Him. So that's the kind of thing what Moses was doing. He was in his presence, uh, you know, hearing from God, having communion and whatnot. And so he did not realize that his face was shining of what of God's glory. Once again, highlighting the point is that you become like the one you worship. Okay. Uh, once again, we'll learn more about this in the next chapter. Is when you've been with Jesus, okay. When you've been with Jesus, everybody around you will know that you have been with Jesus. Can I say that again? When you've spent time with Jesus, when you've sat in his presence and you come out, everybody around you will know that you have spent time with Jesus. Here we see that in the physical example, in Moses' life, uh, you know, that he had to cover his face. That means everybody in the camp of Israel know, knew where Moses was. Right? It just doesn't come with some makeup. He just didn't go up the mountain. Everybody knew that Moses was in the very presence of God. And same thing happens in our lives as well. Okay? So that's the first thing. What does worship do? It changes and transforms us. Right? You become like the one you worship. If you worship the dead things, the idol, uh, in idolatry stuff, you become just like them, it's, you know, lifeless. That's what it is. Okay, the second thing, we experience the presence of God, right? We experience God's presence. In worship, we become more aware of and experience God's presence. In worship, knowledge becomes experience. You can underline that, highlight that, okay? In worship, knowledge becomes experience. Right? In worship, okay, you've heard, okay, God is like this, God is like that, He is amazing, He is wonderful, and whatnot. You have all that knowledge, but in worship, all of that becomes experience, like you're encountering Him, you're tasting His goodness, everything, like firsthand. Right? That's what it says in John, uh, James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. It, he's, it's not saying that He might draw near to you. He doesn't say that, you know, 
God will think about it, drawing near to you when you draw near to Him. When you choose to get close to Him, He will get close to you. Right? You agree with me? Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29, it says, But if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find Him if you seek Him with all your heart and with all your soul. Okay? Uh, seek, the word seek, S E E K, doesn't mean that you just search and give up. You keep searching until you find that thing. Okay? And that's what seek here is. Okay? You keep seeking Him until you find Him. You keep reading. You keep reading and reading and reading until you hear his voice, okay? You know, until you hear him speak from his word. So that's the second thing. In worship, we experience God's presence. And finally, worship empowers us to rule and reign, okay? Worship empowers us to rule and reign. Uh, Revelation 1, 5 to 6. It says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and made us kings and priests. For what? To his God and Father. He made us, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, right? This, Verse 6, he made us kings and priests to his God the Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Okay, And all of these scriptures are there in the verse, in your notes. I'm just reading off, uh, off them. Okay, um, just a couple of highlights over here. Um, very quickly, uh, let's go to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Are there? Yeah, easy book to find, Exodus uh, 19. Verse 4 onwards, it says, You yourself have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Underline myself. Okay. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Okay, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, uh, long story short, the, the heart of God from the beginning is the entire nation of Israel will be a holy nation, a priesthood. It was not just a Levitical priest, uh, le the tribe of Levi. But then again, if you read the book of Exodus, then uh, e eventually, uh, you know, Moses comes and says, Who was on the Lord's side? Come this side. And it says, Only the Levites came, uh, you know, and joined Moses. And it is from there, the tribe of Levite became the priesthood until Jesus was crucified on the cross and shed his blood. He made a way for all of us right now, like we read in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, that we are all made kings and priests. Okay, First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, a royal priesthood. There are two different words which kind of contradicts royal and priesthood. When you say royal, what comes to your mind? Kings, queen, prince, princess. That's royalty, right? And you don't think of priesthood when you think of royalty, right? You know, sacrifice, fire, burning, altar, dirty hands, all of that. But here, that is what worship is doing us is in worship, we are empowered to rule and reign. Okay. Um, this is quote by Bill Johnson. Uh, he says, 
we rule with the heart of a servant. Okay, I say that again. We rule with the heart of a servant, but we serve with the heart of a king. Okay, I hope you get the depth of it. But yeah, uh, we rule with the heart of a servant, and we serve with the heart of a king. Um, so the three uh, three simple things that what worship does, uh, what, what what happens when we worship is worship changes us. Uh, we experience the presence of Lord. Uh, worship empowers us to rule and reign. Right? Can someone read Matthew chapter four, verse eight and ten? Thanks. Right. So the devil knows the power of worship. And the devil knows the power of your worship. Uh, all he wanted is, all he wants us to do is bow down to him. That's exactly what he wanted Jesus to do, isn't it? Uh, but Jesus responds classically. We know, we know the story of it. Um, so the point is, beware, like it says in Psalm 115, Psalm 115 verse 8, we just read, right? You become like the one you worship. Uh, be very mindful of whom you worship, guys. Right? Are you guys with me? Um, so in conclusion, just uh, we, I want to skip to page 24 in your PDF. I don't know what your notes are talking about. Um, page 24. I think it must be page 22 for you. Um, and I want to very quickly, keeping in mind that Matthew chapter 4 was 8 and 10, right? We should be very careful with whom we worship, what we worship. I want to talk about the hindering attitudes in worship. Hindering attitudes in uh, worship. We've spoken at length about pride in this class, right? Uh, I've, I've, we've read a lot of scriptures. I don't want to go back and read all the scriptures that we've read. Uh, you know, from if you want to write it down, you can go back and check it out. It's uh, Proverbs chapter sixteen, verse eighteen. Proverbs sixteen, verse eighteen. Uh, Proverbs chapter six, verse sixteen. Isaiah fourteen, chapter fourteen, verse thirteen and fifteen, thirteen to fifteen. Uh, I mean, there's so many things that you can study about pride. The opposite of pride is humility. Now, again, even the, but that we've spoken at length, right? Um, I would encourage you, as your personal study in your personal quiet time, uh, you can look up like, all the scriptures from the Bible on humility. Okay, uh, just do that for your own exercise. Uh, all when I say all, that means there will be a lot of verses. Okay, uh, but it's very important. So, one of the hindering attitudes in worship is pride. Uh, what does it do? It's like, why should I worship? You know, I know better. I don't need anyone to worship. Uh, I am better than everybody else. That's one. The second thing is irreverence. We do not rever God's nature. We expect His blessings to be showered on us without any sacrifice, investment of prayer, or humble repentance on our part. Okay, no reverence. That's uh, and why should I pray? Uh, you know, why should I do anything? If he wants to bless me, let him bless me. <laughs> That's another attitude of worship. The third one is spectatorism. I'm just gonna keep my eyes open. I'm just gonna look around and see how Sri Radha is worshiping. I'm just gonna look around and see how Shira is worshiping. I'm just gonna be a spectator. I'm not going to engage in worship. That's an that's an attitude that you don't want to have. Um, sentimentalism. <laughs> the music means more to the worshiper than the message of the song. Amen. Oh, <laughs> overly familiar songs are in danger of becoming sentimental for us. Lord, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. God is like, how many heart do you have? How many? 
uh, you know, we uh, when you put music more uh, importance than the message of the song. Um, point five. Mm, Sotram. Paying mere lip service. Paying mere lip service. That is what. Just singing the songs, but again, being a spectator, you know, it's like, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have you way in me. What's happening over there? <laughs> Say, hey, yeah, you know the song by heart, you know, and just coming naturally. But then, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So let's move on. A fear of manipulation. A fear of being controlled by the worship leader. They're like, I don't want to lift my hands only because the worship leader is saying, why should I do what he's saying or she's saying? Why should I close my eyes? I want to keep my eyes open. I don't want to be manipulated. <laughs> Okay, uh, resisting change. Uh, we have never done it this way before. Resisting change. We have sung only hymns, brother. We don't want to sing any new song. For 70 years, we've been singing only hymns. Who are you to come and tell us to sing a new song? <laughs> okay, uh, sometimes there is a fear of change. Uh, but the Psalms says he's put a new song in our hearts, a hymn of praise to our God, right? Um, again, all of these points are very, you know, very familiar. You, most of you already know about all these things, but these are the hindering attitudes in worship. Okay? Um, I want to actually stop here um, and uh, let's conclude this uh, section th with this chapter. And uh, in the next class, we'll resume with chapter 6 and whatnot. Okay? Um, any questions or anything to share? Did you all learn something? All right, uh, all of you online, I hope you all are doing well. Uh, Shiv Kumar, Karen, Prabhu, all okay? Arila, all good? Nina, Jachan? Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. Uh, Cool. Um, so we'll uh, meet again next week and uh, go through the next um, chapter. All right. Let's pray and we'll conclude. Father, uh, thank you once again uh, for this time, Lord, that we could learn from your word. I pray that your word will bear fruit in our lives, Jesus. We once again give you all the glory, honor, power, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good day. Take care. Take care, everyone.